Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, Keith, I just want to thank you. Those first couple of songs, they, uh, I had a little bit of jitters going into this, and after those, man, I'm good. I'm ready to go. All right. I'm all picked up. I'm good for it. Oh, great. Praise God. Yeah, let me just go ahead and get set up here, and then we'll go into what we want to talk about here today. So as we go through this, it's really important to me that everyone has their Bibles open. It's kind of a dense sermon. Um, so just have it open and try to stick with me the best you can. We're going to spend most of our time here in Second Chronicles and Second Kings, going over uh, three kings of Judah and doing a little bit of a character study based upon their lives and the actions that they took and ultimately their deaths. We still warming up here or? Oh. Okay. I have no idea why it's doing that. I don't know why it's showing up like that. I'm super sorry here, guys. Let me just go back into it and try that again. Well, gosh, I don't know how to get out of this. So, oh, it's weird. It's different on my screen. Okay. So it's called three kings and four categories. And as we go about the study, uh, you can kind of notice here right off the bat that I only have three categories beneath it. And uh, it's not a typo or anything. We're going to circle back and cover this last category, which is going to make it four categories. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn with me, we're going to start out here in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, studying King Asa. Let's just go ahead and pick up here in verse 1. 14, verse 1 of 2 Chronicles. So Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa his son reigned in his place, and in his days the land was quiet for ten years. Verse 2. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, for he removed the altars of the foreign gods, high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images. Verse 4. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was quiet under him. So what can we learn about Asa just off this first little bit? He was born to Abijah or Abijam, depending on if you're in Second Chronicles or Second Kings, right about 930 BC. You can also see that his father, his heart was not loyal to God, and uh, he himself walked in the sins of his own father. And you can also see here at the end that Asa, he was a reformist. He reformed Judah uh, away from this pagan gods and towards the living God. Asa did good in the eyes of the Lord. He removed the pagan altars, broke down the sacred, uh, broke down the sacred pillars, removed Ju or, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God and observe his commandments. So you can see right here from the start that Asa, he's a, he's a pretty good king to this point, And he starts off super strong. But... You know, you always need a good testing of your faith. That's when you really figure out what you're made of when it's that fourth and long situation. And throughout the study, most of these kings, it's going to come in the form of another nation coming to challenge them. So in Asa's case, sorry, guys. Okay. In Asa's case, it's actually going to come uh, from the form of the Ethiopians after the land was quiet uh, for that 10 years. Here in verse, let's jump over to verse 8. 
and figure out a little bit of what Asa uh, is commanding in the army that he has when he goes up against these Ethiopians. Verse 8 of chapter 14. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah who carried shields and spears from Benjamin, 280,000 men who carried shields and drew bows. All these were mighty men of valor. So in total, if my math is correct, we have 580,000 people that King Asa is commanding both from Judah and those of the tribe of Benjamin. Here in verse 9, let's figure out what the Ethiopians have going for them. Then Sarah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots, and he came to Merishah. So he's outnumbered two to one in this situation. He's outnumbered two to one in this situation. You know, imagine being Asa or being one of these soldiers going into this. Oh man, I'd be nervous. You're going to die. You got two people ready to kill you, and you got to take out two of them to even make these odds even, just in your case. So uh, let's see what Asa does in this situation. Pick up here in verse 10. So Asa went out against him and set the troops in a battle of Ray in the valley of Zephathah at Merishah. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So he seeks the Lord. Uh, he reaches out to the Lord. He goes, I'm outnumbered. I'm in a bad situation. I have no choice but to go to you. Lord, please help me. And ultimately, God is going to reward him for this uh, here in verse 12. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and Ethiopians fled. 13, and Asa, the people who were with him, pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. He was rewarded for that of, which he, uh, of seeking the Lord. He was rewarded for this, and it ended up working out for him in this dire situation. And here in 15, he's actually going to get a warning from Azariah, and this is going to reflect into his life later. Here, uh, please pick up with me here in chapter 15, verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to them, Hear me, Asa, and all of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You see this so much with Israel in the Old Testament that when they turn their backs on the Lord, it never works out for them. Uh, they always get carried away. They get deported. They get killed. Terrible, horrible things. And this is once again that warning that's going to Asa. Now, please jump with me. Uh, we can go ahead and actually fill out the early life stay of the nation. He inherited a bad situation, yet started strong. And during his reign, he kept great faith and completely relied upon God. So now jump with me. We're going to go over to 2 Kings 18 and do a little bit of Hezekiah. Okay. 18 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Verse 4. He removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, which in and of itself, it was a healing element for those Israelites. But at this point in history, they started worshiping the bronze serpent instead of worshiping the man that created it. Um, and that could be a lesson for us. Do not worship the gifts that God gives you, but worship the giver of those gifts, God himself. Let's pick back up here. For until those days, the children of Israel burnt incense to it and called it uh, Nehusan. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him, none were like him among all the kings of Judah. None were also before him like him. Um, so we can see out of this first little bit that he was born to Ahaz right about 740 BC. Ahaz brought in much false worship and idols based on pagan gods. While Hezekiah, on the other hand, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. 
And then let's jump forward and go into verse, uh, verse 11 here and finish this little bit out. And we're going to figure out a little bit of what's going on with uh, Assyria and Israel at this time with Hosea. Verse 11, Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive to Assyria and put them in Halah by the harbor of the river of Gozan and in the city of Mendez. So what did the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, just do to the Israelites? He deported them over uh, into Halah, right? And during this time, a little side note, uh, Hezekiah can see the struggle going on with the Israelites and the Assyrians, so he quits paying taxes to the Assyrians, trying to get away with this, thinking, you know, they're not going to notice uh, us not paying our taxes, and uh, ultimately they do end up noticing this. Uh, and we can see this here in 14 regarding the payment. Uh, then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to a king of Assyria, let's just saying, I have done wrong, turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. And the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold. So he's kind of, he's backtracking against himself. He goes, I'm sorry for what I did. Whatever you impose on me, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to make this right with you. Just don't take my land. Don't kill my people. Don't do this. Don't do that. Verse 15. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver. You're going to also have two uh, kind of stumbling points of Hezekiah. Though he was a great king, there's two, uh, two points where he kind of messes up, and this is going to be that first one in verse 15. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord. And from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid, gave it to the king of Assyria. So you can see a little bit about his struggle that's going on. And this is that first stumble that he had. He's, uh, he's taking that which is not his and giving it to them, right? And uh, this ultimately is not going to work out for them. Uh, uh, Sennacherib and king of Assyria is going to send messengers here in 17, uh, verse 17, running right about through 35, uh, basically saying that, uh, they're going to take away those people of Judah and, you know, Hezekiah, don't trust in him. Uh, we're going to deport you to a land. And uh, we'll just pick up here in verse 29 and get a little snippet out of this. Verse 29, thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen, Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make peace with me by present, come out to me, and every one of you eat from his own vine, and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern. 32, until I come to take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die, but do not listen to Hezekiah. These messengers for Sennacherib, uh, they're, they're offering, if you can pick up on this, they're offering to deport them. They're saying, we're not going to kill you, we're not going to hurt you, you can eat from your own vine and drink from your own cistern. But ultimately, we're going to bring you to a land like your own, a land of grain and a land of bread and vineyards, but it's not going to be your own. The same thing that they did with Israel, uh, offering to take them away from their land. And you can see Hezekiah's response here in chapter 19, verse 1. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with the sackcloth, went into the house of the Lord. Verse 2, then he sent to Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe and the elders and the priests, covered with sackcloth, and they went to Isaiah the prophet. Let's jump forward here to verse 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, for uh, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. What's, uh, what's Isaiah doing? What's ultimately the Lord doing here? He's giving him a little bit of a look and a reassurance into the future. He's saying that, do not worry because he's going to ultimately go back to his own land and he's going to die. He's going to fall by the sword. And you're going to see this come to fruition a little bit later here. Uh, jump forward to 15. We're going to get a prayer from Hezekiah uh, after he receives this letter and this word from the Lord. 15. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, spread it before the Lord. 
Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth have made the heaven and the earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. And you're going to get a little bit more, a little bit of quoting here. Uh, in regards to Sennacherib and jump forward here with me to 35. We're going to see that, that, that fruition of God's word and uh, Sennacherib ultimately being defeated. And it came to pass on a certain night, this is 35, it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed the camp of Assyrians, 185,000. When people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. 36, so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away and returned home and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons, Adramelech and Sherazar, struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. Exactly how God said it was going to happen, it happened, right? Uh, God gave the warning saying that he's going to uh, fall by the sword in his own land and that is exactly what happened. So we can go ahead and we can knock out the early life. We can knock out the early life and the state of the nation of Hezekiah. He inherited a bad situation. Remember, his father was not with the Lord. Ahaz was not with the Lord. But he still started strong and pushed for reform. During his reign, during his challenge from the Assyrians, he slightly stumbles, right, but still strives to do as God says, and he stays faithful. Now we're going to jump over into 2 Kings 21 and finish out this with his son Manasseh. Verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Jump forward to verse 3. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal, made one wooden image, as Ahab king of Israel had done, and he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. Verse 6. Also he made his son pass through the fire, practice soothsaying, use witchcraft, consult Consulted spiritists and mediums. Uh, consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and Solomon his son. So Manasseh is off to a bad start. He was born to Hezekiah right about 709 BC. Hezekiah was one of the last great kings and had Judah truly on the right path. He is number seven of the eight great kings of Judah. And uh, Manasseh assumed power at the age of 12, and you can also read that he was evil in the sight of the Lord. He raised up altars for Baal, sacrificed his children. I don't know if you were able to pick up on that. That was something that was kind of hard for me to pick up on. Uh, when he's talking about uh, sending his son pass through the fire, that's child sacrifice. He's sacrificing his children to pagan gods and uh, soothsaying. He's using witches of the time to tell the future. Evil guy. He's off to a terrible start, right? Let's go ahead and figure out a little bit of his reign. And we finished out that last little bit saying that he was going to anger God. You can see God here in 12 uh, uh, really just saying how angry he is, for lack of a better word. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. 13. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria, and plummet to the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. 14. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance, and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. He made God so mad that he just wants to be done with this. It's like the flood. He wants to wipe his hands clean of it. And uh, you can see here in 16 that he's going to continue to do awful and terrible things. Uh, 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Besides his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil things in the sight of the Lord. Uh, you can also see in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 9 that he actually seduces Judah to become more evil than the nations that the Lord uh, had destroyed. Manasseh is uh, in drastic contrast to these other kings, right? He's doing a lot of evil. That's why I put it red. He inherited a great situation, 
but he was evil in God's eyes. Manasseh had no faith in God and did much evil. He seduces Judah to do the same. He has Judah on a terrible path. He's on a terrible path. And uh, now let's jump over and we're going to start finishing out the end of the life for these three kings. So please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And we're going to finish out Asa here. Okay, 16 and verse, let's start out here in verse 2. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me as there was between your father and my father. So he's taking that of which is not his, once again, giving uh, and trying to make a, tre a treaty with Syria out of uh, God's gold and those of which the house of the Lord um, and this is a big no-no for him to do. Uh, and you're ultimately going to get a warning here from Hanani in uh, verse 7 of 16. Verse 7, And at the time Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied upon king of Syria and have not relied upon the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria had escaped your hand. Uh, so he's getting a warning from Hannah. And I. He goes, hey, you're a pretty good guy up until this point. You're doing some great things. You messed up. Let's go ahead and let's fix this problem and let's go forward away from this. Uh, Asa does not take this news very well. Uh, you can see that here in verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, and he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some people at the time. So he does not take this news well as he ends up imprisoning Hanani and starts oppressing people. The guy who was so good and did so well against the Ethiopians, trusted on the Lord, completely threw it away and starts doing terrible things. Uh, you can see here in verse 12 that ultimately he's going to succumb to, uh, uh, to uh, this, this unfaithfulness and turning his back upon the Lord here in verse 12. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in the feet. His malady was severe, yet in his disease he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. What was said, if you seek the Lord, uh, he will be there for you. But if you turn your back upon the Lord, he will turn his back on you. He turned his back on the Lord and finished out his reign, uh, not in the right sights of the Lord. Let's jump over to our other good king, Hezekiah, and let's finish out him and figure out uh, if he's going to end up faring any better. Please turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 20. Okay, verse 1. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. It's, it's a similar situation to what Asa had, right? He's faced with death, but he reacts very differently here in verse 2. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before with you in truth and with a loyal heart, and I've done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Verse 4, And it happened, before Isaiah had gone out into the middle of court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return, and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your, I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days fifteen years. A completely different uh, ending of this sickness, right? He ends up praying to the Lord and seeking him, and he's rewarded for this. And uh, over here, let's jump over to verse 12. The Babylonians heard about how sick he was, so the king of Babylon ended up sending messengers over to him. Uh, verse 12, And at that time, Baradoc, a baladin, son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Verse 13, And Hezekiah was attentive to them. He showed them all the house and all of his treasures, the silver and the gold, the spices and the precious ointment, and all of his armory. All that was found among his treasures, there was nothing in his house or in all of his dominion that Hezekiah did not show him. This is going to be Hezekiah's second mistake. Uh, he ends up 
bragging to the people of Babylon. Look at all the great things I have. Look at the treasures I have. And uh, Isaiah is going to uh, not take this very well here in 16. And then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all this that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried away to Babylon and nothing shall be left. Thus says the Lord, 18, And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you and you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Uh, he's going to be he's going to be warned and ultimately uh, in his lineage, everything's going to be taken from him because of this mistake. And uh, you would think if you realize that you just ruined the lives of your descendants, that you'd be a little bit remorseful. But here in 19, Hezekiah is not. Uh, in 19, here we go. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of which the Lord has spoken is good. For he said, will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? And ultimately, this is the last little bit of an account for Hezekiah. And he ends up dying after this. Uh, he shows... Uh, he shows no remorse for his actions or any care for the future. Um, and it, it's, it's a little bit of a stumble, but it's not a total fall like Asa. And let's go ahead and finish out the no good uh, Manasseh in Second Chronicles chapter 33. So it's interesting, if you, if you go in Second Kings, you get like about that much about, uh, about, his, or about Manasseh's early life and about the same amount for his, uh, his reign and his death. And it, it, it finishes out saying Manasseh was evil and he died. And uh, that's it. But in Second Chronicles, you actually get a repentance and a turn for Manasseh. Uh, please come with me to verse 10 of Second Chronicles chapter 33. And we're going to learn a little bit more about his uh, latter days. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of king of Syria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in an affliction, he implored the Lord his God, humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him. He received his entreaty, heard his supplications, and brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. 14. After this he built a wall out outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon Valley uh, and jump forward a little bit. He put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. 15. He took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built from the mountain, the house of the Lord. And in Jerusalem, he cast them out of the city. 16. He repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrifice on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. He completely changed around Judah, completely changed around his life, repented and turned from it, and ended up seeking the Lord. And uh, this was just an absolute evil human being who completely turned himself around. So now we can go ahead and we can finish out uh, these kings and the ends of their lives. You can see that Asa... Asa turned away from God and fought anyone who pushed reform. Hezekiah, he showed great faith in his last days. He has imperfections, but is still known as one of the last great kings. Manasseh, he repents, humbles himself, and decides to serve the Lord and fix his wrongs. Well, it's also interesting, if you go through the kings of Judah, you can see that Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. And uh, though Hezekiah was one of the great kings, Manasseh, his son was absolutely evil and atrocious. And if you dig a little bit deeper, Manasseh's son, Josiah, ended up being probably my favorite king of Judah. And uh, he ended up finding the scriptures and doing all these great and amazing things. So Manasseh was evil. His son was great. And then Josiah's sons were evil. And it's like, it doesn't matter how, how much you bring your, your child up in the church and how well and how good of an example you give to them. If you don't help them with their hearts, they're going to turn away from God. And you can see that all throughout the study of the Old Testament and specifically the kings of Judah and kings of Israel. So now let's go into a little bit of self-application. And we're going to finish this out with the words of Christ in all of these. So firstly, you have starting great, yeah, having a poor finish. This is the warning of Asa. A great start is awesome, but it's all for a waste if you can't finish. Let's go ahead and turn to the parable of the ten virgins to send this one home in Matthew 25 and verse 1. Verse 1. 
25 and verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Verse 3, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took their oil in their vessels and their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. All that matters is when you, when the Lord is ready to come or when you're ready to stand in judgment of the Lord, you are ready to meet him. Uh, it does not say that the Lord is going to come like a bull in a china shop. It's going to come. He's going to come like a thief in the night. Right. So be ready. And this is our warning for those of us who are here. Don't finish out like Asa. Now let's jump over. Rough and sinful starts. This is the lesson of Manasseh. A rough start and a sinful past aren't good, but there's still hope. The first message Christ brought was that of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. You can live your life full in sin, but if you repent and turn to Christ, you can walk in a new and be a new creature in Christ, being buried with him. Therefore, you will be raised with him in accordance of Romans chapter 6. Let's go ahead and send this one home with the labors in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1. Chapter 20 and verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning, hired laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for Daenerys for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. And he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. Verse 6. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard came to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last of the first. And when those who came were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a Daenerys. And when the first came, they supposed that they received more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, to have borne the burden of the heat all day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me for denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Many are called, but few are chosen. It's never too late to turn from your sin. And each received uh, the promise of eternal salvation. Um, never too late to turn away from that. And then we're going to have the warning of Hezekiah. Or I should say the encouragement. You've kept great faith, but you stumble. If you stumble in your walk, don't let it be a fall like Asa. Realize your mistake and finish out as a great, but imperfect servant like Hezekiah. Though he was not perfect, he is still known as number seven and the eight good kings of Judah. Now we're going to wrap this up and finish this out with the fourth category. The final category is that of the unbeliever who has not yet repented. They are that Manasseh that hasn't turned. They are our friends, family, and loved ones who are not yet disciples of Christ. They are the lost sheep, and it's our job to help them to repentance. If you notice on this, you can see that this, this fourth category, it's someone started off with a bad influence in a life without Christ. Uh, during their life, they've, they've lived a lost and sinful life up until this point. But notice that that third box is not yet filled out. They have time to be Manasseh. They have time to turn to repentance. And I pray that all of us are ready to help those who are lost and help those who are at this point. Uh, if you yourself are at this point and you have not yet put on Christ through baptism, or if you have any needs of the congregation of the church, uh, please come forward and speak to any of us while we stand and sing the song of invitation.